Welcome everybody. This is the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform uh, Community Call. It's March 28th. It is the last days of March, so we are heading to the second quarter of this year, which is really, really cool. In this call, we always have Microsoft speakers, so Microsoft coordinated speakers. It might be that every now and then some may be in um, to for some of the demos, but we'll see what's going to happen in the future. But typically, it's always Microsoft uh, people presenting, uh, and that means PMs, engineers, cloud advocates, and so on, with the latest on what's possible within the Microsoft Microsoft or Power Platform areas. This time in the agenda, uh, we focus on more on Microsoft 365 side of the house. Last time we had also Power Platform topics, but we'll talk about uh, the latest news on Microsoft 365 platform and uh, updates. We'll cover some of the typical slides, and, but we do get that feedback for those who actually are in this course every single week are like, why are we showing always the same slides? But there's a reason for it. So we do get also the feedback that it's a good to recap all of those assets because there's a lot of new uh, attendees in this course as well. And then after the typical uh, recap of what's the latest news and what's happening and the assets, we'll move into the demos roughly quarter past. And we have three demos today. Every single demo slot is 15 minutes. We'll start with Luca and Alex on the SPFX 1.17 release, what's new and what's there, and the latest uh, capabilities. Alex is going to do Call live demos on, on the latest capabilities. We just released the release candidate for 1.17 uh, within an hour or so. And then Sebastian Levers is going to talk about Kyoto SDK generator, uh, which is now G8, so generally available, and covering what you need to know about that one. And then last uh, topic of the day is Gary uh, talking about deploying a Microsoft Teams app to Azure using the Teams toolkit for Visual Studio Code. Now, we do have quite a few assets available for Microsoft 365 and Power Platform areas. We do have our community channel where we publish all of our different community calls across the all, across the, all of the different topics which are being covered. Uh, subscribe there today. It's the easiest way to know when there's new videos available. We also have our uh, LinkedIn group to, for a discussion. So that's a smaller group for li within LinkedIn where you can share your findings and discussions. If you don't want to do that within your profile, again, that's completely fine as well in LinkedIn, but or you can have this more isolated friendly discussion within that group. We have a lot of open source assets available, but as it might be a bit difficult to find the relevant sample for you, we also have this sample galleries, which are really optimized for a specific purpose, which is making you more efficient on finding the relevant sample for you to get started on building Power Platform or Microsoft 365 experiences. And you can find all of the different open source initiatives, samples, and SDK details, and all of that uh, from a one centralized location, which is AKMS forward slash community forward home. We do have quite a few community calls available, like, uh, like mentioned. Uh, this one is the 8 a.m. Tuesday community call, which is always with Microsoft at, uh, speakers. We have the Power Platform uh, monthly, Microsoft Identity Platform monthly, Office Alliance monthly calls, and then our 7 a.m. Thursday uh, series, which is either the Microsoft 365 Power Platform community call or Viva Connection and SharePoint Framework community call. That's basically more community demos in those calls, typically covering the individual samples which have been contributed within our GitHub repos. Now, you can download the recurrent invites from the AKMS community calls, and you can always check the agendas for the upcoming weeks um, if you sign up for the meetup. Uh, that's a great way of knowing like in Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, week before, what's going to be covered in the agenda. Um, so Meetup is a great way of actually accessing that information if you're interested in doing that. Now, I mentioned that there are quite a few calls where we actually welcome community demos, and we would love you to sign up uh, to do a demo within those calls. So do please use the AKMS uh, community forward slash request forward slash demo to sign up to do a demo. That could be something like, hey, I build a sample. I had a, uh, I create something for my customer, which I cannot share directly as an open source. That's fine as well, but you can talk about the learnings and things which you find out what works and what doesn't work, and all of those things are welcome to be presented uh, within the course. The, the presenting in this course is a great way of also getting, for example, an MVP award uh, because this course and the presentation within the course are being evaluated as one of those things uh, to get the MVP award if you're interested in doing that. We do have a lot of assets available for getting started in Microsoft 365 development areas. So you can sign up for the Microsoft 365 developer program. You'll get a free E5 tenant with 25 accounts, which is really cool. So you're not just always running in the administrative account. So you can actually build and do testing properly there. Uh, we also have a lot of, lot of modules available in the Microsoft Learn across the whole different areas and functionalities um, as well. We also have our three different weekly shows where we talk about Microsoft 365 Power Platform um, from a 
community perspective or from a partner ecosystem perspective. So we have the Microsoft 360 developer podcast hosted by uh, Jeremy Fake, uh, Aisha Bosch or Paul Shefflin. Then we have the Microsoft 360 PMP Weekly, which is hosted by yours truly and Wildek Mastercards. And then the Power Platform Connections hosted by David Warner and Hugo Bernier. So you probably want to sign up and uh, to get the notified in all of them. A lot of, lot of good stuff uh, being covered in all of those shows. As mentioned, we have a lot of samples available. We do have more than 1,500 samples from Microsoft and from community from a one centralized location. So if you go AKMS forward slash community forward slash samples, you can actually find all of the different samples and the contributors also in the community. So you can easily find people, sample, key, uh, use the keywords or whatever uh, when you're looking at finding that relevant sample for your business case, which hopefully gets you then unblocked uh, within the situation that we're having. Really, really good resource to take it. Advantage. Now, as you find the sample then from the sample gallery, you might be thinking it's in GitHub. What does that mean? How do I get start using that? Not everybody knows how this actually works. Luckily, we do catch you covered with sharing a scaring initiative and David Warner is going to talk about that one. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, mm -hmm. Vesa. Well, uh, as Vesa mentioned, we have 1,500 plus samples. Those don't just grow on trees, everybody. They come from all of you, and we appreciate what you're doing. But you may be new into the community and not sure, like Vesa said, how do I work with the landscape of GitHub? Sharing is caring are programs and sessions that provide you hands-on guidance. That means we're going to join on Teams calls together live, and it is a safe space. So you can ask any all questions because we don't record. We're going to walk through together how to accomplish things like doing your first pull request. Maybe you don't even know what a pull request is and want to find out. We're going to show you, and we're going to do it together. We've just retooled our general first-time contributor session, tested it with some MVPs, went great. And we've got a Power Platform Samples contributor coming up uh, in April, which is just around the corner. And we'll be scheduling that first-time contributor along with some of those other ones. So definitely keep watch at ak.ms slash sharing is caring, and we will let everyone know on the socials as well when we schedule new sessions. Thanks, Vesa, back to you. Excellent, thank you, David, on that one. Um, that, that's, uh, that's a really, really good to do some applause as well. <laughs> Excellent. Crowd goes wild. Thank you, David. Woo! Now, uh, Woo! just to recap some uh, events which are happening. Uh, so this week on Wednesday, there's a Build Once Deploy Efficiently Connect across Microsoft 365 event, which is really focusing on the new capabilities and options which we have available on the Microsoft Teams development. As you're building those Microsoft Teams applications, they can be extended in the multiple other applications as well. So really, really cool uh, setup that's happening tomorrow, March 29th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, uh, so you can register there advance uh, and it's a live streamed uh, from the Microsoft Reactor, if I remember correctly, full, technically from multiple different YouTube channels. But if you register, you will know the locations and where to access that. Now, later then, uh, after that one, in May 2nd to May 4th, actually starting already end of April, we have the Microsoft 365 conference happening in Las Vegas. And there's a lot of, lot of great presenters in here. And we have a really, really, I've never seen this many CVPs and presidents of Microsoft in a one conference. So there's quite a few keynotes where we talk about new features, new capabilities, new options, even announcements which are happening within this conference uh, from these different people across um, Microsoft 365 and of course Power Platform. Really, really cool uh, opportunity to do an in-person meetup. Um, I will be there as well. David will be there, Hugo will be there and so on. So a lot of, lot of um, familiar faces for sure. And yeah, a teaser on the on the chat uh, from Yanko. We have teased a bit about SharePoint's new UX uh, changes, which is going to be announced in that conference as well. I cannot confirm or deny any of those rumors. Now, we also have a Microsoft uh, European Collaboration Summit happening, and then later in May, uh, May uh, twenty. I'm watching the dates. Where's the dates? Where's the dates? There's the dates. May twenty fourth to twenty sixth at uh, twenty twenty three, and this is happening in Düsseldorf. So if you are located in Europe or you don't want to fly across the pond from US in here, it's it's convenient, conveniently located in Düsseldorf. There's going to be thirty Microsoft speakers, a lot of MVPs, and and uh, two thousand five hundred attendees. So really really nice setup uh, as well. Now if you're based in the US or you want to fly over, and uh, there's awesome opportunities in 
in the Edgecon side as well. There's the June 12th to 16th in DC, Seattle later in August, and Chicago later this year as well. Now, flying back to Europe, we have a Power Platform conference happening in Dublin 20 to 22nd of June 2023. Again, depending on your interest, a lot of different events happening uh, across the world. And then on top of that, we have community-driven events, uh, where, which you can find from AKMS Community Days or communitydays.org. And there's a lot of, lot of different uh, events happening across the world, which you can take advantage. Some of these events are free, some of them have a cost, some of them are remote, some of them are in person, but do check them out at the Community Days uh, site. Now, we do have quite a few news uh, from Microsoft uh, within the last week. There has been a lot of, lot of really cool announcements uh, coming across the, across the technical stack, across the Microsoft Cloud. Um, so first of all, we announced the Microsoft Loop app, which is now in private preview. Not private preview, public preview. There's a big difference on that. It's now in public preview, uh, and people can actually get access on that one. Um, so that's a really great uh, e collaboration tool, which you want to check out. We also announced uh, the Microsoft uh, Copilot pretty recently. Um, and uh, there's actually has been announcement on teased of our announcements happening on the Microsoft business application side as well. There's, on the business application side, there's a launch event happening on April 4th. Now, I didn't actually mention in this, in this slide, but we also had a lot of announcements on the Microsoft Teams uh, v2.x version, uh, which was announced a lot of, lot of news uh, related on that one, how it has been built. On the developer side, there was a, a uh, blog posts related on building custom communication experiences using Azure Communication Services UI library. There was Teams Toolkit Visual Studio Code update for the March 2023. And uh, there was an updated public preview on SharePoint Framework 1.17. That's the last week announcement. This week, we already did a release candidate 30 minutes before this call. And there's a lot of, lot of other news as well. Now, before we go to the actual stars of the day and the demos, let's actually do a quick crew photo for those who are willing to put their camera on. Crowd goes wild. And they actually move here. <laughs> That's pretty loud. Just, Is that one loud? just here. That's just started to crazy. I mean, I have a really loud clap. That was all. It was all just <laughs> my hands. What can I say? Yeah. Let's go, team. Let's go. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> we do have this. Pretty soon we'll stop. People are basically saying, I, I would rather join on this course, but there's always this weird background noises. I don't, yeah, you know. <laughs> That's and I practice all week with our yes. uh, mouths and sound effects. It's all natural. <laughs> it's like I'm Absolutely 100%. Voice. We're not yet recording. I think we're maxing out roughly 50 bits, uh, 50 uh, seats in the room. Let me put the recording on. Let's do some hand waving, crap a cave animation out of that. Thanks everybody for joining. Once again, awesome to have you on a call. Awesome to have all of the hands waving. Excellent, excellent, excellent. We'll crap a GIF animation out of that. And now there's a small pause. There we go. Excellent. Brilliant, brilliant. And a big hand on the middle. Excellent. Let's then go to the actual starts of the day. So we'll start with Luca and Alex. We'll move then after that to Sebastian and then Gary as the final demo presenter of the day. But first with the update on SharePoint Framework 1.17 and what's new and what's there. Luca. Okay, so thank you very much for having us, guys. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever you are, uh, for everybody being here. Um, so here's a couple of updates on the direction that we want to make for uh, SharePoint Framework and uh, the extensibility platform for Microsoft 365, SharePoint Online, Viva, Microsoft Teams, and uh, Microsoft Meta uh, Outlook and Office applications. So. SharePoint Framework, as a recap, is a framework that you can use in order to build the solutions and capabilities for multiple Microsoft 365 canvases. We started with SharePoint with web parts and extensions and full page applications and app pages. Then we enable the functionalities and capabilities of SharePoint Framework in Microsoft Teams, from which you can use SharePoint Framework to build personal apps, Teams tab, meeting apps, and messaging extensions. With Viva uh, connections and Viva topic, uh, that which are based on uh, SharePoint as a backbone infrastructure, you can use SharePoint framework to build extensibility pages for topics or um, cards for Microsoft uh, Viva connections uh, dashboard in the home experience. And then the more that we are progressing and the more that we are moving to a way to have uh, other 
canvases being part of the Microsoft 365 ecosystem, you will see that you can start using Microsoft uh, SharePoint framework to build solution for Outlook and Office applications. And we'll talk about that actually in a little bit as part of 1.17, new functionalities and capabilities. The, in terms of Viva Connections, if you have not seen Viva Connections, Viva Connections is the new kid that gives you the ability to provide functionalities and capabilities for people that want to bring their functionalities where they work. They want to be able to access on the get go a specific on the get go a specific uh, capability without needing to go and finding these solutions everywhere in their environment. Uh, we have this concept, which is the dashboard. The dashboard contains cards. The cards are the tools that the employees and users can use in order to accomplish their goals during their day-by-day -day job. Uh, recently, we launched what is called the Connections Home Experience, which is the one you can see on the left, where you can have a more immersive and targeted dashboard and feed and resources experience without needing to build your home site and creating your page and adding all your web part there. Connections lives both in Teams Rich Client, Teams Mobile, and the web, where basically you can build your solutions and cards built using SharePoint framework, and those cards will seamlessly work across all of these devices and all of these environments without needing for the developers to be able to make any kind of a strange arrangement uh, so that their solution can basically work everywhere with no problems whatsoever. In terms of 117 and what we're going to have in 117, Alex, do you want to talk about this one? Sure, I can do that. Uh, so today we released release candidate uh, and uh, hopefully we will be uh, releasing GA version in the next couple of weeks. So what uh, are the changes in there? We now support pop-up uh, flow for the token acquisition in uh, browsers. Uh, we bumped the version of Teams GS SDK to 2.9.1, which is the latest one for Teams GS. Uh, web part of ex actions uh, now go GA. Uh, we also bumped uh, Teams manifest to 1.16 when you click on sync to Teams or add to Teams in the modern experience. So uh, after that, your app will be automatically, if you have personal apps uh, enabled, it will be uh, automatically available not only in Teams, but also in uh, Microsoft 365 app in Outlook as well. Uh, we bumped the version of uh, Adaptive Cards uh, Schema to 1.5. It means that now you can use, for example, tables in your quick views in ACES. Uh, we now support additional file types in media actions for Viva Ace cards. Uh, we added on before action handler for ACES, and uh, I'll show it to you during the uh, demo. Next one is ability to specify initial focus elements in ACES quick views. This is for uh, accessibility purposes. Basically, you can define what element should be focused first for the screen readers. And uh, one more thing, uh, it's especially valuable probably for uh, developers who work on different SharePoint solutions. Now you can have SPFX surf tenant domain OS variable, and uh, when debugging in surf the JSON file, you will have a placeholder that will be automatically replaced with these OS variables. And uh, now I'll probably just uh, jump to the demos to show some of these uh, changes. Take it over. Awesome. First, let's start with V291 for Teams.js. So, for example, Teams.js has new live share SDK available starting uh, with version 2.5. Before this release, we were on 2.4, so it was unavailable. But now, as you can see, if you go to our context, SDK Microsoft Teams, Teams.js, you see this live share host, which is basically the new API that was added in the bump of the uh, Teams.js. Next one that I mentioned about the OS variable, now in the server.json configuration scaffolded by the human generator, you have this tenant domain placeholder. And uh, if you have this SPFX tenant URL serve, sorry, don't remember correctly the uh, name, it is in the uh, documentation, but basically if you have this OS variable, it will be automatically uh, replaced. So if you're working on different solutions, but all of these solutions you're testing on the same tenant and same site URL, basically, you can just put it in OS variable and uh, Gulp serve will automatically serve the needed tenant for you. Next one, 
Top actions, as mentioned, they're going GA, and with that, we also changed a little bit the uh, types for the top actions. In uh, previous versions, we had uh, top actions types kind of proxied from property pane, and it was a little bit confusing because some properties were not working, others were working, but not like you were expecting them. Uh, now all the types like ITOP actions, top actions, field type, et cetera, et cetera, all of them are specified in a separate uh, module that you can separately install if, you're, uh, if you want to use top actions. And uh, same as it was uh, before in the uh, web part, you can override this get top actions configuration to basically in the same way as for property pane to provide additional top actions uh, in edit mode. And just to remind you what are the top actions, uh, let me go back to edit mode. So here is my web part, I'm in edit mode. So this button and this drop down are basically top actions that you can add uh, to your web part, which is kind of uh, more clean uh, UI for the authors of your page than the property page. Next one, jump into uh, sync to teams. So if you don't uh, remember or have never done that, so you can go to the uh, tenant app catalog in SharePoint. And when you select specific SharePoint framework solution, uh, you have this button at to teams that basically provisions uh, your SharePoint framework application to teams app catalog. If of course you're supporting teams uh, scenarios uh, and how to support team scenarios. If you go to uh, web part manifest, we have, we have supported hosting here and Teams personal app and Teams tab are basically showing that uh, you want your web part to be, to be available as a tab in your Teams and also as a Teams personal app. And with the update to the uh, manifest of the uh, version of the manifest for Teams, now when you click add to Teams and if you have your web part available as a personal app, in that case, your app will be automatically available in Teams. But also, if you look at that, it also works in Teams, Outlook, and Microsoft 365 app. So basically, now you don't need to do your own custom uh, manifest, uh, package it as a zip file, and upload it separately. Now we are doing everything for you by just clicking Add uh, to Teams. Next one, go into changes for ACES. So one thing to mention is uh, this on before action and here it's it's of course a dummy code but basically uh, this handler will be fired before any action in uh, adaptive card extension and action is like uh, button click, action submit, for example, or opening a click view, opening external links, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you can check what action type is there. Uh, you have additional configurations like ID of the quick view or uh, additional data for action.submit action. And for example, you can uh, log this information in your external telemetry service or something like that. One remark here, this Handler is not intended to change the flow of the things. So basically, if you want to try and change like, hey, it's an open quick view event, let me do something and replace the quick view. No, it's not working like that. Don't do that. Most probably you just break the application. This is mostly for you to track things, to potentially log something additionally, maybe a little bit change uh, the internal state of the uh, ACE, but not like changing the flow of it. Uh, second thing, uh, focus parameters in the view view. It's an additional property in the quick view class. Uh, so what you can provide, you can provide I focus parameters uh, value in there, which has only two properties. One is focus target, which is ID of the DOM element and basically ID of the adaptive card element in your quick view and uh, area life attribute that basically will be set to this specific uh, element for the screen reader to correctly read the information in the element. Another thing to mention is adaptive card schema v1.5 support and here for example I have new element table with three columns and uh, one row with with uh, some information in there and uh, if I go back to my demo I have a workbench with my uh, carton here and in the quick view I have this table rendered so basically now you can use it as well. 
And that's all I have from demo perspective. And I'll go back to Luca with some additional cool things. Yep, that was awesome. Thank you very much for doing that. Now, so what are we very brief because we have other people waiting for other fantastic demos. Uh, things after 1.17. Uh, one of the big things that we are working on is the ability for people that are already invested on Microsoft 365 and Teams uh, bot to be able to reuse these investments and have their bots building uh, adaptive card extensions for Viva Connection dashboard, both uh, quick views and card views. Uh, we want to move the cash APIs to general availability. We are working very, very hard to have a great notification service capability in Viva Connections. More of that uh, later during the semester. Uh, we want to have the better support for home site in Viva Connections mobile and have the ability to have your home site surfacing in mobile as well. Uh, we are working to build and bring a new card the templates uh, for uh, in Viva Connections. One of the first one that we are working is the ability for you to build a card view that will give you the opportunity to provide search capability and experiences to end users. Hopefully we will be able to give you a brief demo for this very soon. And then we also, another thing we want to work on is give the ability for have a card designer also include the API calls in a secure fashion. And then last slide is very, very uh, further that we also want to have additional functionalities in Viva Connection, just like multiple instance or having tablet support, which is already rolled out for some of the capabilities, at least in iOS operating systems. Uh, we want to have more dashboard personalization improvements. You've already seen that with Viva Home connections, you can now do inline editing. We want to move even more there and having more uh, editing and dashboard personalization capabilities. We are working on the development jail feature so that you can say that you want to define one of your geos, which will be a virtual geo or a real geo, uh, in your tenancy and basically dedicate that geo for development purposes so that the geo can have different permissions than the rest of your other geos and the rest of your other solutions in the tenancy. Uh, we want to do audit on ungoverned script so that we want to be able to tell you where you have enabled or disabled no script in the site collection list in the tenant admin experience. And then uh, we other related technologies. Uh, we are introducing support for vanity domains in Microsoft Graph API. This feature is rolling so that very soon you will be able to understand if you have vanity domains in the SharePoint online, which these URLs are in Microsoft Graph. Uh, we want to have Microsoft Graph APIs in uh, SharePoint pages and other functionalities around the Viva Feed and News Links API. Veza, do we have a quick Three minutes for one last demo or not? No, because no, unfortunately, no, because we're, Perfect. we because of the other slots. Let's do that in another time. That's much better. Uh, so it's, it's good to recap that. Uh, I guess that's I can imagine what that would have been. But from a timing perspective, uh, we need to everybody has 15 minutes um, and we will run out of time uh, on the hour. So let's then move to the Seb's screen. And we're going to talk about Kyoto SDK. Excellent. We can see the slides. We will. We will talk about Kyoto. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. We're excited to come to this group today to announce the general availability of a tool we've been working on quite extensively in the last two years, which is called Kyoto. You might have seen this in, in some preview stages in the past. Kyoto is a really, really, really uh, cool tool to work with HTTP APIs, but what is it exactly? It is a client code generator for HTTP APIs that are described by OpenAPI from the Microsoft Graph team. So basically, we have been rebuilding our foundation tooling to build our Microsoft Graph client libraries, but we went a little bit further and we basically enabled generating HTTP clients for any type of open API described APIs. 
the experience is available as a command line tool. And I have a, a really, really cool demo later on to show you how we're also integrating that in other properties that we have here at Microsoft, which I think is really, really cool. If you want to give us a, a star on GitHub, we'd love and appreciate that. Uh, aka.ms slash Kyoto. If you want to see our um, uh, documentation right now, it lives on GitHub. Very soon, it's going to be all on Microsoft Learn. For now, microsoft.github.io slash Kyoto. Yeah, Vincent, it's exactly like and subscribe. And we need to have a good thumbnail for that YouTube video. How can you get it? Well, first, aka.ms slash get slash Kyoto. You're going to go, you're going to install. It's all based on a .NET tool. So you're going to do a .NET tool install dash dash global microsoft.openapi.kyota. That will install the core CLI experience inside your machine. Works on Mac, works on Linux, works, works on Windows. And we have a ton of other ways to also install it, either via, uh, via our releases, via uh, a Docker container, or if you just want to build Kyoto as this is all built in the open source on GitHub. Uh, what can I do with Kyoto? So first, we have an area where we want to talk about discovery. You want to be able to find APIs that are available somewhere to help you do the thing you want to do. Um, so you will be able to search for APIs as part of our, of our CLI experience. Uh, we have built-in support for searching the API gurus directory and also tagged GitHub repo. So you will be able to provide open API descriptions and tag them in your repos, and we're going to be able to bring them inside the Kyoto experience. We also support authenticated for private GitHub. Uh, so you can log in and actually get these capabilities inside your CLI, even if it's a private repo. And um, we're going to be able to also, in, in the future, provide more catalogs there. Um, we have the ability, as part of the discovery experience, to show you the path hierarchy. And I'm going to show you that later on. It's really, really cool where you can actually see what the API looks like. So you can make decisions on which areas of the API you really care about. And finally, it's, it's very simplistic. There's more, more to that in Kyoto, but search, show, and then generate. Take that experience, take that API that you really care about and generate an API client with your API of choice. And that will generate in a couple of languages that you have access to, either C Sharp, TypeScript, Python, Ruby, Java, uh, a CLI experience, and I'm missing one, um, PHP. Thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, I know that. And Go. There you go. Uh, we're going to show you all that in the demo. Uh, so, for example, if you're searching for Kyoto, you just go, you do Kyoto search GitHub, and you're going to find all the, the available capabilities for um, GitHub, all of the different APIs that have been published to the API Gurus directory. From where you will be able to identify a specific open API description, where you will be able to use some um, inclusions. You're going to be able to say, I really care about the search capabilities of GitHub. So can you provide me all the capabilities that have the slash search in there? And from there, you're going to be able to see a nice tree of all the APIs that are in there. And from there, you will be able to generate a client in C Sharp or in TypeScript or in Go or in Java or in PHP or in any other uh, languages. Add that to your project and have a very limited, super powerful, very specific API client to work inside your application. That's really, 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 really cool. I'm going to show you that in a second. And at the end, we're going to tell you all the different underlying packages that you need to add to your solution to make sure that you have all the, the, the best experience right there. We're providing for you um, uh, default implementations. But if you want, you can also override all of that and roll out your own serialization or authentication or uh, client libraries, if, depending on the languages that you care about. Maybe you want to have a specific HTTP client that you want to use to get access to your data. You will be able to roll that out. So once we're done with this, because we are now, we're GA, we're going to also roll an experience inside Graph Explorer. Graph Explorer will enable you to identify the capabilities that you care about Graph 
and generate a subset of endpoints just for your app right there. And this is the ideas we have here. We're also coming, that's what I wanna to show today, our VS Code extension, where you're gonna have the exact same experience or very similar experience um, that will uh, exist in Graph Explorer, but now straight inside the IDE. So without any further ado, and I wanna make sure I have time to do the demo, let me move on to our demo. Let's do that. Let's open up my console here and let's start. So I have an app uh, that is working in that repository here where I can do Kyoto search and I'm gonna search for GitHub. And now I can find all the different APIs that have been pushed to API Guru. If you wanna just bring your own open API description, you can also do that. Uh, you can search for um, any type of stuff that you want to translate in Klingon. You can also find that as, as part of the API gurus. You, you do you, right? Um, in that case, I want to be able to get this capability right here. But you know what? I'm a little bit lazy. So yes, the Kyoto CLI experience is great. I show, I've shown you the experience in the slide. But let's go into the real cool stuff where I'm gonna show you the exact same experience but as part of our VS Code extension. But let me go here, let me close that part here. And let me go to this where I have the Kyoto Open API Explorer where I can search and let's start from here. I can search for GitHub where I will find all the, the same APIs that I found earlier. I'll be able to click on that API here. On the left side, I'm gonna be able to see all the different endpoints that are available as part of GitHub. In my case, what I really care about is I wanna go in my repos because I wanna do a demo on syncing pull requests because I'm always extremely lazy with pull requests and never go back to GitHub. I wanna have them in my Microsoft 365 to-do to -do list. I wanna sync the PR from GitHub straight into Microsoft to do. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create myself a client to GitHub just for my own repo. And I'm gonna, all the pools that are on a specific repo, I'm gonna go here. I could actually use the, the um, here I can just say, I want this endpoint. That's it. That's the only endpoint I, I, I care about. I don't need to bring a full NuGet with all these capabilities that might take too much space or whatsoever. No, I'm just gonna hit play here. I'm gonna say, I want it to be called GitHub client. I want this to live inside my project within the namespace uh, github to do demo dot github. And I want that to live inside the GitHub client folder that I have in my app. And now it, it's gonna ask me for which language I wanna use here, which is C Sharp, Go, Java, PHP, Python, Ruby, Shell, Swift, or TypeScript. Right now, only C Sharp is a stable language, which means it has been pushed uh, as a generally available release, but we're also uh, working hard on having all of these languages available. You're gonna see them once our Microsoft Graph SDKs are, are shipped for these languages, you're gonna see them almost automatically being bumped up in Kyoto at the same time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna select this here. Um, it generates my client and that's it. It just generated me a full client. I can go here, I will find my GitHub client right here where I see my client. I, I'm gonna see uh, all the different models that I need. I'm gonna see my, uh, um, request builder, which is what I'm going to play with. But the beauty here is I actually don't really care about this because this is generated code. The part that I really need then is this. That's where I want to work with the capabilities that I care about. Um, so for instance, I'm going to build my own GitHub client here. Well, that is very interesting. What did I do to break my demo? This is, oh, because I guess I have, oh yeah, I created a GitHub client. Let me just delete that guy because I already have it. So I have, I created twice the same thing. So that's why I have, uh, I have that red squiggly. So now 
the only thing I have to do, I'm creating myself an authentication provider. Um, we have created for this specific uh, demo a GitHub auth provider. We provide by default some Azure implementations. Uh, they're an anonymous uh, provider also uh, right there. Where I pass in a couple of parameters. I create myself a request adapter that will basically adapt all uh, my requests using my authentication provider. And now I'm ready. I have my GitHub client. What it means here is that from now on, I will be able to do the following. Let's just focus on the code here. I will be able to do something like GitHub uh, client dot. And now GitHub Copilot actually comes into play, which is actually really cool, right? It helps me understand I have Copilot. It understands my the, the shape of my SDK. It understands what it can do. But if I look at here, I only have my repos available. I don't have all the, the, the client code available. I can then do indexing here, which is how uh, GitHub works here. So my index here, which is the name of my organization, the name of Kyoto, sorry for that, demo repo. And then I can just do a, a dot pulls because that's what I care about, dot get async. So you see how simple this becomes to, to write. Very predictable. All of our APIs will actually look all the same throughout any type of HTTP APIs you've been using. Something I wanted to show before I hand it over to the next presenter is how simple it is to build these kind of apps. We have in total 67 lines of code to build a full sync engine between GitHub and the Microsoft Graph. I've done the same for my Microsoft Graph client where I have exactly the same thing here. But if you know the graph client usually in C sharp, you're gonna see that there is not a lot to it. I only have dot me and only have dot to do because that's the only thing that I really care about. Meaning that in the end, if I run this specific piece of code and that's how I'm gonna end my demo today, which is a little bit scary to do all of that and just do all this. I'm gonna just do a dot net run here where I'm gonna run this specific piece of code I'm going to go through double authentication to help me get into GitHub and then afterwards get into, uh, no, that's not what I want. That is, give me a second. I'm just going to copy that guy here. Gary, I'm sorry to steal you one minute. Uh, and then I need to, I, that had to happen, right? Give me one second, go on my phone doing these kind of things. There we go. I'm connected then. It's going to ask me the same thing for the Microsoft Graph. The beauty of device code where you just feel like you're always logging into uh, to your app. Now I'm going to log I'm going to be logged in here. I'm just going to continue. I'm logged in and then automatically the code will continue. We'll add tasks in my task list inside the Microsoft Graph from two pull requests that were there. I go here, and now I have all of this available as part of this. So ak.ms slash Kyoto, go have a look, build your own HTTP clients. We'd love to get your star. We'd love to get your feedback on that, how we can improve. Vesa, back to you. Excellent. Let's then directly jump into Gary. Thank you, Seb. Really, really cool. Cool demos today. This is really, really awesome stuff. Yeah, great demo, Seb. Um, right, hopefully you can hear me and I will yep. share my All screen. Good. Yep. All good. Take it away. Perfect. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gary Schunder. I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. And today we're going to show how to deploy a Microsoft Teams app to Azure using Teams Toolkit for Visual Studio Code. If you have been following along for the last few weeks, uh, this is uh, the final uh, week of uh, a series covering the uh, Microsoft Learn uh, Learn path on Teams Toolkit called Build and Deploy Apps for Microsoft Teams using Teams Toolkit for Visual Studio Code. So if this is the first session that, uh, that you've seen of this series, uh, there's you know, four of a weeks for you to, to go through that's been, been published uh, on, the, uh, on the community YouTube channel. 
week one, we went through and just showed how to get started installing Teams Toolkit um, and uh, also creating your first app from the, the sample gallery. Then in week two, we moved on to building bots. Um, in week three, we moved on to building tabs. And on week four, we uh, went through Teams JavaScript library uh, and showed how we could integrate some of the capabilities uh, from Teams JavaScript library to uh, create chats uh, from a uh, Microsoft Teams tab. And this week, we will be going through how to deploy and publish our app. Um, so. Uh, again, if this is the first time that you've heard of this learn path, uh, you can check that out. Uh, it is live at aka.ms slash learn slash teams toolkit. You can get up to speed with all of the information that, uh, that I've talked about um, over the, of the pre previous weeks. Okay, teams toolkit. So let's have a quick overview. So teams toolkit is a, uh, a, a series of tools uh, one tool for Visual Studio Code. It's a Visual Studio Code extension. It helps you build, uh, deploy, and publish uh, Teams apps uh, directly in Visual Studio Code. So if you're a JavaScript or TypeScript developer, you're in a Windows, Mac OS, or, or Linux, uh, this is the, is the tool for you. However, if you are Yep, .NET developer using C Sharp. There's also Teams Toolkit for Visual Studio 2022. Um, you can download that now. Um, and this is only available uh, for Windows. But for this series, we've just been concentrating on the Visual Studio Code uh, extension. Now, I just want to cover a few prerequisites for, for this uh, session I'm going to show you. So first of all, we need a Microsoft 365 uh, tenant that has custom apps uh, in enabled, or the uploading of custom apps uh, enabled. You obviously need Visual Studio Code as Teams Toolkit uh, is a Visual Studio Code extension. You also need Node.js installed. Either version 16 and above is perfectly fine. Uh, and for this session, because we're deploying to Azure, you'll also need an Azure subscription. Okay, so if you've built an awesome app, now what? Up to this point, everything that we've shown has all been built at locally. Um, so that's where you're going to be starting when you first start developing your Teams app using Teams Toolkit for Visual Studio Code. So your next logical step really is getting that off your local machine and into a remote environment, most likely a development environment where you can test that, you can validate it's the, that it's all working when it's not running on your machine. And obviously share that as well with other people to uh, to test and not have independency on your own machine running. So there's three features that Teams Toolkit uh, helps us with. The first feature is provisioning to the cloud. So this feature basically makes it easy for you to deploy the required cloud infrastructure resources that's that's needed to to host and and run your app. We have deployed to the cloud. So this is the feature that's going to build um, and then move the, uh, the, the, uh, the code to your infrastructure. And finally, publishing to your organization as well. And this is where you're going to upload the, uh, the, the Teams app and distribute that within your Microsoft 365 tenants so that you know, other users can then, uh, can then install that app. So first of all, I'm going to jump into Visual Studio Code. I'm just going to go through a sample project, which is a tab app, and just show you some of the key kind of files um, and, and, and parts of the project um, that's relevant to, to deploying your app. So here we are, Visual Studio Code. Uh, I already have an app uh, scaffolded using Teams Toolkit. It's just a, a tab app. And I want to bring your attention to two folders. We've got the .fx folder and templates. Now, templates, um, here is where our uh, templates for building out the infrastructure live, as, as well as our manifest as well in the app package. If I expand, expand the Azure folder, you can see that we've got a number of bicep files in here. So these are created. Uh, when you create your, your initial project. So these are provided for you out of the box. And what's useful here is that it's all pre-configured 
for you to be able to just run these. You don't have to make any changes to to get your your basic app up and running. So this is for a tab project. So we can see that if we go to the provision um, bicep file, it describes the, uh, the the different resources that, that are going to be needed. Um, an Azure storage uh, account is going to be created. So when we want to uh, deploy our code, um, that's going to be deployed to uh, to Azure Storage, and a few other bits and pieces in there as well, like identity. Um, but this is enough to just get you get you started. It also comes um, set up with configuration as well. So there's an Azure Parameters .dev JSON file, and in here you can define some of your own um, own values. And you can expand this file, and it's already hooked up, so you can reference these uh, these parameters within the uh, within the bicep files now you get a generated uh, resource name uh, so this is just uh, you know the name of the project and then some random numbers uh, and letters at the end so if you want to be very specific about the the naming you can come into here and and, and name the uh, the resources how you would like them uh, but this is what you get as as default so Let's show you how this looks when we uh, we want to provision, deploy, and publish. So I'm going to move back to the slides, and let's go through that. So first, we're going to provision to the cloud. So first of all, we need to sign into our Azure subscription. We can do that through the toolkit, just like any other login. Just log it into uh, your account where your subscription. Uh, is is located that will show up in Teams toolkit, and then you can use the provision in the cloud uh, feature to you know, select a resource group that already exists, or actually create a new one through the tool, and then just confirm the prompt that will allow toolkit to to provision that. And the process starts. You can click the output window to get more details. It's going to take a couple of minutes to just go through, depending on the project that you've selected as well. Obviously, there's more resources in, let's say, a bot project uh, that needs to be provisioned. But when it has, uh, you get a nice uh, ability to access your uh, your resources. You can do that on the left-hand pane or, or using the, the button that's provided. You just log into Azure, and there you go. So we've got an identity and storage ready and available for us to now go to the next step, which is deploy to the cloud. So use the deploy to the cloud feature, accept the prompt, and this kicks off the build. Again, depending on how complex your app is, this can, can take a, a few moments, but when it's done, It'll deploy the code and give you the confirmation that that has now been pushed to your uh, to your cloud infrastructure. And then the final bit is distributing our app. So we can use publish to teams and select the install for your organization step. And this pushes the app to uh, to Teams uh, admin portal where we can go and we can approve uh, this app. So we can see we've got one app uh, that needs to be approved. We can search for that and see that it's been blocked. Then actually go and publish that app as well to unblock that. And then we get the confirmation. And yes, it may take a little while for the app to appear, but once it appears, it shows in the store. You can select that app and you can add it to, uh, to, to Teams. And there we can see that it's actually running in your Azure environment as well. So three quick and easy steps to be able to get your app from off your local machine and actually running in Azure. Uh, and able to test that uh, with you know without having your local machine um, actually required and you can distribute that to, uh, to test users in your uh, in your development environments a few resources which we'll put in the uh, in in the the recording description as well so I just want to remind everyone that this is the final session of the uh, of, of the five week series that that have been running. So if you you know want to go and check out the learn path, uh, go to akms slash learn slash teams toolkit. And like I say, it's the final week, so a little bit of a celebration there. 
And finally, if you have gone through the learn path or you're going to go through it, let us know how we're doing. Make sure that when you're going through, just you know, provide some feedback. We're looking at these, we want to make it better and any feedback, any uh, areas that you want us to to focus on next, we, we'd love to, to hear from you. And with that, Vesa, back to you. Excellent, really, really cool. Thank you, Gary, on that one. Right on time. This is awesome, awesome, awesome. Let me uh, share my screen from here. Cool. Uh, so thank you, Luca. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Seb. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next week uh, on 4th of April, it is April already next week at this time, uh, we'll have Bob talking about the Microsoft Teams and building Microsoft Teams app with the live share SDK, which is really, really cool. Uh, so there's this huge next uh, sample, which he's going to explain that. Then Rajiv, Harshi, and Mashes is going to talk about latest to Microsoft Graph connectors. So what's happening there? And then we'll have the first of a three demos coming up from the Microsoft Graph hackathon, which just just ended a few weeks ago, and uh, that was the first half of March, um, and the first Wiener demo will be actually uh, booked and shown uh, within the call. Now, in general, the recording of this uh, session will be available within 24 hours at the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Community YouTube channel at TKMS forward slash community forward slash demos. And if you subscribe to that one, you'll know exactly when the video is available. You cannot access the recording directly from the chat, uh, but you can access that through the YouTube um, as we're pushing things out. Um, as already said, April 4th is the next uh, call on this one. Thursday this week, we'll have a call as well. So there's two calls this week in general within our recurrent calls. Check them out from AKMS community forward slash calls. But that's it for today. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll be in touch. Bye-bye.